the sun sets on the Spanish forests of Extremadura. Hunters look and listen. Wolves, in their lean summer coats, gather at a kill. Spain is one of the very few places in Europe where wolves exist in any numbers. Daybreak and the sun dispels the mists, slowly laying bare the hills of western Spain. Extremadura is a region of harsh extremes. In winter, cloaked in freezing mist. In summer, parched and sun-scorched. But in the forest there is shade and shelter, a measure of respite from the sun's fierce heat. And here, hidden deep in Spain's Extremadura, is an abundance and variety of life once familiar all over southern Europe, but now found only in this last wild, wooded stronghold. The forest is a refuge for some of the rarest hunters in Europe. An imperial eagle carrying prey. Extremadura lies along the Portuguese border. The forest where the eagles live covers around 150 square miles. It's a fragment of an ancient forest that once spread over most of Spain. In the old days, it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Pyrenees in the north right down to the Straits of Gibraltar without touching the ground. Imperial eagles were soaring over this landscape long before man settled here some 20,000 years ago. They saw the Roman legions marching into Extremadura 2,000 years ago. But the invading armies had little impact on the eagles and their forest. In time, the Romans were driven out by the Spanish. Later, the Arabs swept in from North Africa. The Eagles' forest outlived them all. In the 16th century, the conquistadores left the poverty of Extremadura to plunder the golden cities of the Incas, and still the trees slept on. Then the rot set in. Over the last few centuries, the forest has been falling fast to the axe. Now in some places, bulldozers have been uprooting its ancient oaks. Yet a small area of the original forest has survived, and part of it is now protected by the Monfragüe Natural Park. In the 1930s, Monfragüe's remote gorges offered a refuge to anti-Franco partisans. Now these rocky places are the sanctuary of a very special bird. The black stork once lived throughout Western Europe. Today, it inhabits only this part of Spain. While its relative, the white stork, has adopted the habit of nesting on buildings in many European countries, the black stork nests only in old, undisturbed forest areas with streams and pools.
It feeds its young on sticklebacks, perch, lizards and frogs. It was to protect both this rare and beautiful stork and the imperial eagle that Monfragüe was established. But other important members of the bird community were threatened too, species normally associated with Africa. Black and griffon vultures are present in great numbers. There's a feeling of Africa here, not only in the far horizons, but in the abundance of hunters and carrion eaters. They gather at carcasses, sometimes left by wolves. Only in this part of Western Europe do vultures and wolves live in any significant numbers today. The question is why? Our investigation begins with the forest itself. It's an evergreen forest, mostly cork oaks and stone oaks. Between the trees are shrubs and scrub. Each tree and bush has its own particular inhabitants. A grand old veteran whose trunk is gnarled by perhaps a thousand winters of frost and rain, a thousand summers of parching sun. The oak forests attract many migrants from Africa. The short-toed eagle comes to breed here. Beneath the oaks is a fertile forest floor nourished by acorns and fallen branches. It's home to the marbled newt, a species unique to southwest Europe. The slow-moving newts are quite happy living away from water, feeding on invertebrates in damp vegetation. Samadromus, a type of sand lizard, needs to be quicker off the mark to catch its prey, grasshoppers. With the first warm days of spring, many other reptiles have come out of hibernation. Grass snakes grow to five feet in this part of Spain. Ladder snakes, which are tree climbers, reach as much as six feet in length. The short-toed eagle is the only bird in Europe which habitually eats snakes. It arrives in the cork oak forests in mid-March. Above all, Extremadura is wolf country. Wolves move in and out of the region through the mountains. Altogether, perhaps eight or nine packs roam the oak forest at any one time. Despite its reputation, the wolf has a more relaxed social side. Being pack animals, they spend a considerable time socializing. They roll in each other's scent, and there's a dominance hierarchy. The pack member on the right is indicating his submission to the top, or alpha female. But the hierarchy is flexible. Even a dominant wolf will not inquire too closely into the ownership of a piece of food or a bone when it's quite clearly in or very near another wolf's jaws. The top-ranking wolf is dominant to the male with a bone but keeps a certain prudent distance. The owner of the bone will bite if he's pushed too far. Yet on another occasion, the alpha male shows another male just who is in control. The key to the relative rank of each wolf is the tail. If the tail is raised, then the wolf is displaying his superiority. Uh. 
Although the oak forests of Monfragüe afford the wolf some protection from hunters, its safety outside the conservation area is by no means assured. Wolves are protected throughout Western Europe by the Bern Convention. Although Spain has signed the convention, various regions have subsequently decided to strip the wolf of its protected status. And in other parts of Extremadura, the wolf is still an outlaw. Spring is the mating season. The alpha female is pregnant, and at this stage the pack members are playful, perhaps in anticipation of the arrival of the pups, when they'll all have to cooperate. In early spring, the stony ground comes to life with the flowers of wild lavender. The short-toed eagle is nesting now. Short-toed eagles have just one chick, and the parents bring both venomous and non-venomous snakes to the nest, including grass snakes. The eagles invariably choose a cork oak to nest in. In this part of the forest, they have little choice. This is the only cork tree here, because the area has been planted with Australian eucalyptus, spindly trees that don't grow large enough in the poor soil to hold a nest. parents visit the nest twice a day with food when the chick is close to fledging. Not a snake, but an oscillated lizard. They catch all kinds of reptiles. It's hard to appreciate how much the surrounding forest has changed without seeing it from the air. In the 1970s, before the region was protected, the oaks were felled and eucalyptus planted in their place. It's been a disaster. The eucalyptus has been ravaged by pests and has not provided economic returns. With the removal of ground cover, there is now serious soil erosion and gullying, and the water table is falling. There is little doubt that eucalyptus was a big mistake, and these areas will be replanted with oaks once more. It's hoped that what is now a virtual desert for wildlife will return to the woodland, but it'll take maybe two or three hundred years to recreate the richness and diversity of Extremadura oak forest. The cork oaks are nest sites for many birds. It's the larger trees in the thick, undisturbed forest that are most sought after, especially those on the Umbria, the cooler north-facing slopes of the hills, for by June and July, the heat is merciless. A 
black vulture has brought not food but water to her chick to help it stay cool. Dehydration can be a real threat to the survival of the nest-bound youngster exposed to the sun without shade. The young black vulture is about three months old and within a week or two of becoming a fully fledged member of the largest black vulture population in Europe. It'll join over 200 breeding pairs and at least as many immature birds in Extremadura. The adult shades her chick from the sun, panting as she takes the full brunt of the intense radiation. Her wingspan is nearly eight feet, which makes her the largest bird of prey in Europe. To find food, vultures travel beyond the thick forest to more open country. Early in the year, black vultures are more preoccupied with display and establishing a pecking order than the actual business of feeding. Only one or two vultures will feed at a time. The others are more concerned with trials of intimidation. The black vultures could easily displace the smaller griffon vultures at the kill, but they're more interested in threatening one another. Ravens arrive for the pickings. In Africa, such scenes are commonplace, but the scavengers are long gone from most of Europe. Only here in Extremadura do they still gather to keep alive a memory of that older, wilder Europe. A late-comer griffon vulture tries to force a way in to pick at what's left on the bones. A young griffon is put in its place by an adult. There are nearly 700 pairs of griffon vultures in Extremadura, but they've never been known to nest in cork oak trees. They set their sights a little higher. The griffins rear their young on cliff ledges far above the forest.
Both black and griffon vulture populations are increasing in this part of Spain. One good reason for this is a good choice of safe nest sites. But there's another very important factor that keeps the scavengers of Extremadura in good shape. Every year in Extremadura, a great seasonal movement of livestock takes place. The Spanish call it the transhumancia. This ancient practice dates back to before recorded history. The drovers still use the first roads ever built here, Roman ones. The transhumancia is a passage of animals between winter and summer pastures. Great numbers of animals are involved, several million cattle, goats and sheep altogether. And the distance between pastures is sometimes hundreds of miles. The herdsman's dog has a spiked collar to protect it against wolves. Wolves do sometimes take the younger calves, though far fewer than in the past. The livestock escapes the worst of the summer heat up in the mountain meadows or by moving to areas with a large and permanent water supply. Once it's been decided to move to new pastures, there is no stopping. Lambs are born along the way and following the flocks are the wolves. As they say in Spain, a wolf is fed by its feet. There are many births and there are some deaths that go unnoticed too. One way or another, there is plenty to prey on and plenty to scavenge. There is little doubt that the transhumancia is the major factor in the survival of many of the predators and scavengers here. This is why vultures and wolves can live in Extremadura and in the undisturbed forest they can breed too. These pups are just two days old. The mother licks them to keep them clean and to remove their scent. During the wolf's breeding season, shepherds and their dogs will search for the dens to destroy the litters. The less scent, the less chance of discovery. The mother is thirsty, but before venturing out, she checks that all is clear. A wolf lives by its wits as well as its feet in Extremadura. The she-wolf suckles her pups for about six weeks. During that time, there'll be plenty of milk. Each pup needs about half a pint a day. The suckling produces a secretion in her mouth, which stimulates her to lick her pups. In a nearby sandbank, other families are hidden. A colony of bee-eaters, brilliant summer visitors from Africa which have tunneled deep into the bank to raise their young. Feeding the youngsters can be an awkward business. 
Some of these tunnels are up to 10 feet long and there's no room to turn round. The Bee Eater's tunnels are proof against all predators except for one. A ladder snake is on the prowl. This tunnel is empty, but over the season, the menace from snakes means that some young bee-eaters in the colony may not live to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The steeper areas of Extremadura have been left undisturbed because people have been able to make little use of them over the centuries. It's the flatter areas that have been exploited. Here the trees have been thinned to provide a sort of parkland which is rather like African savanna. In Extremadura it's known as Dehesa. The Dehesa is a system of agriculture as old as the Transhumancia and is found only in Spain, Portugal and North Africa. The land is ploughed every four years. Until recently this was done with oxen. Then a cereal crop is sown between the oak trees if the soil permits. Over the next two years, pasture is allowed to grow. And finally, in the fourth year, the land is left fallow. This rotation of the Deesa means regular winter grazing for the Transhumancia. The oaks provide shade for the animals and for the grass. They also help to hold water in the poor Extremadura soils. Tree branches are cut to make charcoal and provide fodder for goats. But a law of the Deesa prevents over-exploitation, which is fortunate because the trees, and in fact the whole system, also provide a great resource for wildlife. Several kinds of evergreen oaks grow here. The small oaks are browsed and become thick bushes, nibbled by goats into a natural topiary. One day, a bush will sprout at its center and grow up into a full-blown tree. Nearly a hundred species of birds nest in the oaks, including a Chinese species. The azure-winged magpie's main habitat is around Beijing, so it's always been something of a mystery to find it in this part of Spain. There is a theory that it was brought back from the east by early Spanish traders. A more plausible explanation is that the magpie's range once stretched all the way across Europe and Asia. Over thousands of years, it declined, leaving the two populations continents apart. The azure wings have to contend with a host of predators hunting among the Deesa oaks. The black-shouldered kite is another bird that occurs in China, but its main home is Africa. It preys on small birds, including young azure wings. Here, it's caught a corn bunting. As your wings nest close to one another in the trees, almost in colonies, so there are always several parents on the alert. The black-shouldered kites are more concerned with courtship. The male lets his female take food from him. But it's not the kites that have caused the alarm.
As a ladder snake climbs towards the azure wing nest, the whole colony unites to distract it. The young are crouched down in the nest and the snake seems to have missed them. The magpie's combined mobbing has driven the snake from this particular tree. Away from the trees, out in the open, it's the snakes that are vulnerable. The short-toed eagle catches many of its snakes between the trees on the deessa. It grips them close to the head, then attempts to immobilize them. The snake is not poisonous, but the eagle will take vipers, which are venomous. Surprisingly, the eagle is not immune to venom. It relies for protection on the thick scales on its legs and the dense layers of feathers on its body. The long legs also keep the snake's head well away from the more vulnerable parts. When the snake begins to coil around it, the eagle tries to maintain its hold on the snake's head. Catching a ladder snake is one thing, swallowing it is quite another. The wolf has left the den and her pups are now out on the fringes of the deessa. During the day they should stay in cover in case a golden eagle spots them. But like all young puppies they're inquisitive and keen to explore. Once the pups are hidden away, the adult pack goes to look for food. In the brutal and remorseless summer sun of Extremadura, there are often carcasses to scavenge. The pups hear the mother returning and come out to be fed.
They feed on regurgitated meat she has carried back in her stomach. When the rest of the pack arrives, the mother discourages the male wolves from approaching too closely while she feeds the pups. But the males do have something to offer. They also bring back food for the youngsters. And when the mother has no more meat for her family, she leads them to one of the males. Common magpies feed on any scraps left on the ground. The food is all gone, but the pups still beg for more. It's a gesture that will develop from one of pleading for food into an indication of submission as they grow up, an important part of fitting into the pack and forming lasting family ties. As dusk falls, a little owl takes a mole cricket from her mate. A jennet, another night hunter, preys on roosting birds. This slender cat-like carnivore came from Africa centuries ago. In autumn, visitors arrive from the north. They travel 2,000 miles to Extremadura to winter in its forest. Over 40,000 European cranes migrate here each year. Many fly in from as far away as Sweden. They pitch in among the oaks to feed on the acorns.
On the Deesa, a single oak can yield almost 90 pounds of acorns each year, and the cranes have been coming for many hundreds of years to reap this harvest. Even the wild boar and the cranes together cannot find every acorn. In a year or two, some will sprout into spindly saplings. Then, given a few centuries, they will mature into grand old cork oaks. Cork oaks have several uses as far as man is concerned. The branches provide shade and fodder. The trunks provide something else. Every 10 years, the trees are stripped of their bark. This is the cork that's used to stopper wine bottles. If it's skillfully done and the underbark is not cut, there is no harm to the tree. The bark will simply grow back again, as it has done on this tree for perhaps 300 years. With exports of cork from Spain netting 9,000 million pesetas a year, the Deesa might appear to be a profitable system. But the fact is that cork cutting is labour intensive and therefore not very worthwhile financially. The Deesa is a medieval landscape rooted in the past. If allowed to continue, it might go on producing cork and sheltering some of Europe's rarest birds forever. But the pressures to modernise are everywhere. If that should happen, the outlook for the Deesa and its wildlife will be grim indeed. The presence of the imperial eagle demonstrates the health of the region. These lordly birds find their food in the open spaces of the Deesa, but they need the secluded depths of the dense oak forest for nesting. It's no accident that this area is their only stronghold in Western Europe. Invariably, the nest is in a cork oak tree. The imperial eagle is closely related to the golden eagle, and it's often difficult to distinguish the two in flight. The main difference is the greater length of the imperial's tail and the white leading edge of its wing. The female calls to the male as he performs his stooping sky dance above her. the stump of an old cork oak is their mating perch. Imperial eagles were soaring over this land long before the Romans conquered Extremadura 2,000 years ago. Since then, humans have tended and pruned the oak trees, evolving the wood pastures of the Deesa. It's probably the only way of winning any sort of living from this unforgiving land. In the long term, intensive agriculture might turn the whole region into a desert.
There is now a law in Extremadura that attempts to protect the Dehesa oak forests. It forbids the felling of trees and dictates how the branches should and should not be cut. It encourages livestock while at the same time limiting their numbers. But with Spain's entry into the common market, there are now cash handouts for the poorer rural regions, grants for irrigation and modern agricultural equipment. Already outside the protected areas, the oaks have been ripped out to make way for tobacco, strawberries and corn on the cob. In the end, the survival of the Dehesa depends on political decisions. The ultimate answer may be to subsidize the traditional agriculture. Hard cash is probably the only way to maintain these unique landscapes. Without a helping hand from the rest of Europe, the forgotten forest of Extremadura will slip slowly into oblivion. Deprived of protection, what hope is there for these magnificent predators? Thank you.